Did you uh, live in Beganash by chance? No, I did not. I lived in um, Good evening. Valley College, which um, Hi, everybody. Um, it's about 7 o'clock, and uh, we're going to, to get started. Welcome to Loyola University, Chicago's Water Tower Campus. My name is Dr. Brian Schmasek, the Dean of the Institute of Pastoral Studies here. On behalf of our institute and Dr. Michael Murphy, Director of the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage, tonight's co-sponsor of the event, I uh, thank you all for being here with us. We've assembled a distinguished panel to discuss the topic, integrity and accountability in the Catholic Church. With more and more revelations forthcoming in the news, we consider it part of our mission and duty as a Jesuit Catholic University to provide this forum in an academic setting. Let me say at the outset that we'll be discussing some sensitive topics with statistics telling us that one in three women and one in six men will have experienced some form of contact sexual violence in their lifetime. It's likely that there are some here tonight who've had this happen to them. And that's a tragedy. And our sympathies certainly go out to you. We have with us tonight Rebecca Weller. She's in the green and white shirt. She's an advocate who can provide support and resources for anyone tonight who feels upset or triggered by the subject matter. Rebecca also has literature and other handouts available. I should also mention that this event is being live cast and recorded. If you have a comment or question for our panel, but are not comfortable being on camera, you can wait until we conclude at 8.30 to come up and ask your question or make your comment. So with that, let me introduce our panel. Each will speak for about 10 minutes from their own perspective. And after each has spoken, I'll moderate a discussion and Dr. Murphy will have the roving microphone. We'll conclude at 8.30. To my far right, your left, Justice Ann Burke, who served on the Illinois Supreme Court since 2006. Before that, she served as a justice on the Illinois Court of Appeals since 1995. She's a founder of the Special Olympics, and she was one of the first members appointed to the National Review Board for the Protection of Children and Young People, and served on that board from 2002 to 2004. Dr. Rick Gallarde is the Joseph Professor of Catholic Systematic Theology and Chair of the Department of Theology at Boston College. He served as president of the Catholic Theological Society of America in 2013 to 14. It's the largest professional association of Catholic theologians in the world with over 1,400 members. He's a noted expert on ecclesiology, and his books include a revised and expanded edition of By What Authority? Foundations for Understanding Authority in the Church, published by Liturgical Press this year. Dr. Jennifer Hasselberger holds a PhD from the University of London in England and a licentiate in canon law from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. She served as chancellor for canonical affairs in the Archdiocese of St. Paul until April of 2013 when she resigned in protest of the Archdiocesan handling of sexual misconduct by clergy. That same year, she was selected as Person of the Year by National Catholic Reporter, and she's received a number of other awards and commendations. We're so pleased to have these three distinguished panelists here to share their thoughts. Would you welcome them to Loyola University of Chicago? So Justice Burke, why don't we start with you? 
Well, um, I'm glad to be here this evening and I'm glad to see all of you here. Uh, it's very important that we have a discussion um, about these topics. I've um, been talking about them for the last 15 years. Um, didn't know anything about the church sex abuse crisis before the Boston Globe told me a little bit about it. Even as a lawyer, I had no knowledge. But I think I probably um, dove into it uh, head first um, in 2002 when I became a member of the National Review Board with 12 other people from around the country. And we spent the next two and a half years working together, um, looking into the investigation of abuse of minors by clerics. And I use the word clerics, but it really means priests, because we were talking earlier before dinner that the charter of, um, for the bishops that they drafted themselves included the word cleric. And that meant that we could have investigated them. But before we, and that means them, I mean by the bishops and the cardinals, but they removed the word cleric and put priests in before they voted on the charter. So our authority was only able to um, review and look into uh, the priests' abuse of minors at the time. Um, I know that Brian wants me to talk for about 10 minutes, but um, I, I don't even know where to begin. We spent uh, two and a half years with um, others, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, looking at their statistics, and then we are, ourselves interviewed the, as a board um, over 100 individuals, um, not only priests, bishops, cardinals, and victims, but also authors and theologians uh, from around the country to inform us of what this crisis had meant at the time. We came up in our report with about 24 recommendations for the bishops. And um, why we're sitting here tonight talking about it 15 years later is because they didn't necessarily follow our recommendations. All kinds of things we suggested for them to do with regard to their own responsibility. What we found was that the bishops absolutely knew from the very beginning and the cardinals who um, offended they hid that uh, in a systematic uh, cover-up is probably a pretty harsh thing to say, but that's exactly what happened. So uh, the report on the John Jay College of Criminal Justice actually, even though we couldn't identify the bishops um, as part of uh, as offenders, but we did know where priest. A was in a certain diocese, and that bishop permitted that priest to go to diocese B, and we know which bishop in diocese B transferred that person to diocese C and D to make sure, I mean, so we absolutely do know who the bishops and cardinals were, um, but even though we weren't able to publish that in our report. But I think for tonight, um, I'd like to um, defer to my, my learned colleagues, and I'd be more than happy to ask answer any questions that you might have. And it's from my point of view, I'm the person in my position to ask questions. So this may be the first time anybody gets to ask a Supreme Court judge a question. <laughs> <laughs> so I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do I get her minutes? Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> no. You do. You do. I'm kidding. Yes. I'm kidding. Well, it's an honor to be here. Um, you know, when we one of the interesting questions that we were discussing at dinner before our session tonight that that uh, Dr. Hasselberger raised was, you know, how are we exactly defining the crisis or the scandal that we're dealing with right now? You know, we all talk about it as if we we know that we're all talking about the same thing. And the truth of the matter is, I think that's a big part of the problem. I think there's a lot of disagreement about what's we know that the church is in crisis. But when you get people to explain what the nub of the matter is, you get a lot of different explanations. Um, there, there are sort of two larger approaches to looking at this problem, and it won't surprise you that I think both of them have some truth to them, but I also think each of them is inadequate in some way. The first would be to look at this whole crisis as a problem of a few bad apples, uh, whether we think of those few bad apples in terms of priest abusers, or whether we think of those few bad apples in terms of the bishops that enabled them, that moved them around. Uh, 
the, the, the difficulty with that approach to things, of course, is the solution is usually fairly straightforward. Well, we got to get rid of them. We've got to root them out. We have to purge the church of these bad apples without ever, it seems to me, getting at some of the systemic issues that are, in fact, in play here. The second version is in a way similar to the first, except it focuses a little bit more on, the, sees this as a problem of moral laxity. So we're in this situation because of a culture of moral laxity that the church has not been sufficiently prophetic in speaking out against sort of the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. Humanae Vitae came out and priests kind of winked at it, gave married couples permission to use birth control, which then gave them permission to take a rather loose approach to their own commitment to celibacy, and so on and so forth. And so in that particular narrative, the problem is moral corruption in the church, moral corruption in the clergy. And unfortunately, one of the, the particularly, I think, pernicious kind of mutations of this particular argument is a tendency to focus on uh, homosexuality and to blame this on the number of gay priests in the priesthood. And if we just rooted out homosexual priests from the priesthood, this problem would go away. Now, it's not going to surprise you that I don't think that uh, response, uh, that's an adequate uh, a lens for looking at the issue. My own inclination actually is not to focus on the clerical sexual abuse itself, though I think that's a horrific situation and we, we need to talk about it, nor is it to focus on the instances of Episcopal malfeasance, even though those need to be addressed. My own conviction is that we have to get to the root of the problem, and as Pope Francis has rightly pointed out to us, the root of the problem is clericalism. All right, in a deeply embedded clerical culture that has enabled a lot of these things to happen. A culture, by the way, that didn't come into existence in 1985 or in 2002. It's been part of the church for a long time. It's just the particular cultural context of the last couple of decades brought it into the public eye. And so my interest as an ecclesiologist is in trying to get at that root problem of clericalism. And Pope Francis has been very helpful about this, but I have to say there are some aspects of Pope Francis's approach that I think are, are lacking. And that is when he speaks about clericalism and he condemns it, and he does so in the most unambiguous of ways, he still tends to think of clericalism as an attitude. So the problem is priests who are clerical in character, and we need to either not ordain people who are gonna be clerical like that, we need to form them better, we we need to call them to conversion. They need to engage in penance. They need to develop more of a, a humble mean in dealing with people in their pastoral ministry. But I'm not convinced that clericalism fundamentally is an attitude, right? I think it goes to much more of a systemic culture in the church. And as Rita Ferroni pointed out, systemic problems cannot be solved just by finding culprits. They require systemic solutions. And so we have to ask what clericalism is at heart. Clericalism, I want to suggest, is simply in the light in the church, a form of elitism, a sense of belonging to a separate class of persons marked by privilege, deference, and power. And that is deeply embedded in our Catholic culture. As Bob Mickens recently commented, clericalism is a badly mutated gene in our Catholic DNA. And that means that nothing less than kind of a, and I realize as somebody who barely knows the difference between a gene and a chromosome, I probably shouldn't be using this metaphor, but a kind of gene therapy in the church needs to, to be undertaken. So what would that look like? What would it mean to challenge clericalism if we're just not, if we're, if we're not gonna allow that to be just priests need to be humbler, priests need to be more servants? What does that look like? I think from a theological point of view, much of the problem goes to the very heart of our theology of orders. And I'm not gonna be able to develop this, maybe when we come back to it uh, during Q&A, but there is a deeply problematic theology of orders. A theology, by the way, which I do not believe is faithful to the best instincts of our tradition. A theology that focuses inordinately on ordination as the conferral of power and thinks of ontological change in interiorized and 
static terms. In other words, that, that's going to beg clarification that will come up in Q&A. <laughs> uh, I think that there's something profound in the Catholic tradition, a kind of sacramental density to our theology of holy orders. And I don't think we want to lose that. But we are going to have to get at this deeply problematic theology of orders, because I think until we get at that, we're not going to get at the heart of the problem. That problematic theology of holy orders is sustained, and this would be my second area that we need to challenge in our entire structure for for vocational discernment to the priesthood and priestly vocations, um, uh, priestly formation. My shorthand for talking about this, and I say this as a seminary professor of 10 years earlier in my career, and I, I look at that time fondly, and I had the great privilege of teaching a number of wonderful seminarians. But they were wonderful often in spite of the system, not because of it. Because we have a system of priestly formation that is focused on discerning impediments to ordination, not on discerning a genuine charism for pastoral leadership. Which means that if we have a candidate to the priesthood who shows no impediment, who preaches no heresy, who does not egregiously lead somebody in pastoral counseling to consider suicide, <laughs> if they pass their courses, if they attend daily mass, if they see their confessor regularly, in spite of not demonstrating any charism for genuine pastoral care and leadership, most seminaries, most bishops will ordain them anyway. That's a huge problem. Closely related to it is that we have created a structure of priestly formation that is built on a monastic model that in no way prepares diocesan priests for the kind of pastoral engagements that are going to occupy them for the rest of their lives. Thirdly, we need to dismantle the continued um, vestiges of what in the medieval church we called the cursus honorum, the idea that ordination is about ecclesiastical advancement up a rank, right? And it's, it's marked by ranks that have particular titles and privileges and powers that are conferred. And unless we get at that problem that ordination is not conferring rank and privilege, but calling people into a relationship of ecclesial service, we're going to have a lot of problems there. Now, that, in order to address that, there are a lot of particular things that I can't get at now. Maybe I can come back. We can talk about that in, in Q&A. But the last thing is, I would say, our, that problematic theology of orders that manifests itself in a, in a deeply dysfunctional priestly formation system and a sense of uh, ordination as promotion up the ecclesiastical ranks has also created a crisis of accountability. Uh, then Bishop Donald Wuerl, when he was Bishop of Pittsburgh, participated in a conference on the problem of accountability in the church. And he admitted that the church had a crisis of accountability. But he said, I'm reluctant to use the term accountability with respect to the role of the bishop. Because the bishop ultimately is accountable to Christ, not to the church. He sees a horizontal accountability as acceding to a kind of Protestant notion of ministry as simply a delegated ministry, where the priest is hired and fired by the people of God. I would suggest to you that that's a deeply flawed understanding of accountability, and that there is a genuinely Catholic understanding of how the Holy Spirit animates the entire people of God in the process of discernment that can allow for robust structures of horizontal accountability without denying what's essential in our understanding of the episcopate and the church today. Um, I've laid out a number of things that perhaps later in our discussion we can uh, come back to, but I suppose my, my one modest contribution here is to say we need to push the conversation back to the deeper questions of clerical culture in our church. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very honored to be here tonight, and I thank all of you um, for coming and participating in this. It's an honor to be able to speak with you. Um, unlike my, uh, the other panelists here, um, I'm here talking to you because I failed, and I'm sorry for that. I was the chancellor in the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis until 2013. And during the time I served as chancellor, we had a number of minors, boys who were abused. And I didn't do enough. I didn't do enough to keep all of you safe. And I'm sorry for that. 
I'm sorry that there were two boys at the, the original claim that came to us. I'll, I'll tell you how it occurred. I walked into work one day at the Chancery, and my colleague said, come here, we gotta talk. And I walked into his office and he said, we have another case of abuse. And I said, who? And he gave the name of the priest, Father Waymeyer. And I said, what? I warned you. And he said, yeah, I know, it's gonna be bad. And what had happened is that one of the boys that had been abused by Father Waymeyer had been caught abusing his twin sisters, who were five years old at the time. And in the context of crisis intervention, he disclosed that he learned these behaviors from his parish priest, who had been allowed to take him on camping trips and other activities, introduced him to pornography, had him smoking marijuana, and had also abused one of his brothers. In the end, we learned that six of the nine children in that family had either been abused by that priest or by their siblings. Now that's a terrible thing to happen. This didn't happen in 1980, it didn't happen in 1950, it didn't happen in 1960. It happened in 2011. And at the time it happened, the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis, where I worked, was monitoring that priest because we knew he had a long history of sexual misconduct. We also knew that he was smoking marijuana and playing Russian roulette with a handgun that he kept in his camper on parish property and that that parish had a school. Now I had warned my boss not to appoint this man pastor. I had pointed out that the monitoring we were doing of him was insufficient. I had pointed out that there was a great deal of hubris in imposing a priest like this on the faithful. But none of those warnings were considered sufficient enough to inconvenience or embarrass the priest. And so he was allowed to stay as pastor until we learned what had happened. And then, instead of stopping and looking at the situation, what we did is put on a very good face and act like this was all a surprise. How could this have happened? We had no idea. We had had safe environment audits every year. We passed. We didn't have any priests in ministry who were a danger to children. This was a freak event. What we showed the Catholic faithful was the same thing that the church had been showing the faithful for years and years and years. No dysfunction, nothing to see here, but I knew differently. And I expected that finally, something good could come of these boys being abused and that we would change. That we would start taking these claims seriously. That we would uh, take action to make sure there weren't any other priests that were a danger to minors or anyone else. And in April of 2013, I resigned because that wasn't what the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis was doing. And I decided that I couldn't be a part of it anymore. So again, I'm here because I failed. And I apologize to all of you because I shouldn't have been a part of that system for as long as I was. I tell people now when I think of my time in the archdiocese that every day that I was there, I was in a situation of moral distress. And what I mean by that is moral distress in the sense that I knew what the right thing to do was, but the organizational conditions and the tasks that I was given wouldn't let me do those things. So every day was a source of constant crisis for me, not just because of the sexual abuse of minors, although that was a huge problem, obviously, 
but we also had issues of sexual abuse of adults, vulnerable adults. We had financial scandals. We had priests who were stealing from the elderly. In Minnesota, our Archbishop, Archbishop Neinstead, um, spearheaded a, an attempt to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot against gay marriage. We wound up uh, being investigated by campaign finance boards for our financing of that. And in the process of that, we're dishonest with the faithful about where the money was coming from that was sponsoring that. We went through a strategic planning process that hurt the faithful. People lost their parishes and their churches through a process that, at best, I would describe to you as arbitrary and capricious. What I saw every day was a hierarchy and a church structure that treated the faithful with contempt. And I was a part of that. And I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for everything that came from that. And so eventually I resigned. And as part of that process, after I resigned, I had to make a decision. Because I had the opportunity to work in the church again if I wanted to. But for me, I thought the best thing that I could do to honor the boys that had been hurt on my watch and to do for them now what I hadn't done before was to do my best to defeat the archdiocese efforts, which at that time were to try and enter into a minor settlement, which means that they were trying to compel the family to agree to a settlement for the boys without any disclosure of evidence that would demonstrate that they had been negligent, which really means it was an attempt to avoid fully compensating that family for the harm that had been done. That was the first thing that I wanted to stop. And the second thing was that I wanted all of you to know, and all of the people in the archdiocese, that what we had been saying wasn't true. The sexual abuse crisis has not been resolved. In our archdiocese, following my resignation and all of the information I made public, every day it seemed like a new priest was being removed because, oh, it turned out he was a danger to minors. And it was important to me that I was able to do that. And as part of that, I decided that for myself, I would not participate in an institution that had that mentality any longer. So I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. I'm glad that we get this chance to talk about integrity and accountability. Um, but again, to honor all of you and to honor the boys that I failed, I think it's important that I acknowledge that that's why I'm here. So those are some pretty powerful and uh, thought-provoking comments from our panelists. One of the reasons that we invited them here, though, is so that uh, you could interact with, with these experts. And so I would ask Dr. Murphy uh, to take a microphone, and we can go around the room. And if anyone has uh, questions or comments for our panelists, uh, raise your hand, and, and uh, we'll moderate the discussion. Here we are, uh, Mike. Okay, sorry. Uh, is this on? Yes. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, each of you, for uh, what you shared with us. <clears throat> I was just at the um, conference on the thought of of the Pope, Pope Francis, up at, uh, in Wisconsin. There was a gathering of theologians and uh, a number of Rome individuals, including the Apostolic Nuncio. And somebody raised the question precisely of the systemic problem. And somehow it never quite got answered by the panel. Um, and then I raised it again in very explicit terms that, you know, when you're talking about clericalism, 
uh, you can deal with it, as you so clearly put it, uh, as a moral lapse in individuals. But the big issue is the systemic reality that creates and will continue to create the conditions that bring us the clergy we have. And again, <laughs> it was like, do they not understand the question? Or do they, because of who they are and their positions in Rome and whatnot, decide that they're going to skirt it? I'm not sure which, frankly. I, I, I couldn't really ultimately determine which it was. Uh, but you, I think uh, you have all raised the profound issue of the root of what this is about. And unfortunately, systemic change is the hardest change. I mean, you know, uh, and so I, I, you know, I don't know how one can uh, deal with it in any kind of systematic way or definitive way or, you know, what interventions can we make as the people of God in terms of systems of power that has have us marginalized and powerless. That's a that's a very good question. What what can lay people do? You'll notice that we have a panel of lay experts. Let's start with Justice Burke. Yeah, that's um, a question that in, in the real world where you elect your officials and you can um, not elect them the next time and you have some ability to control who might be overseeing our lives. Um, in this situation, a 2,000-year-old organization that's a bureaucracy that is um, well ingrained uh, in the people that are the responsible uh, hierarchy, we have no way to get rid of them. I mean, I didn't hear one word um, yet about any of the uh, uh, sex abuse violations or cover-ups that were sent to the civil authorities, and that was part of, part of the problem. Um, they internally decided, they didn't even use canon law um, to, uh, to reprimand some of the um, offenders of sex abuse for minors. So I don't really know what the answer is, because we have no ability to uh, uh, make a difference in a um, in a way that um, we can control things and get rid of who is in charge of the administration of our church. Um, unfortunately, that's the way I see it. But it doesn't mean we can't do something as lay people. And um, I, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a canon lawyer, but I do know that my voice can be heard and I that's why I'm here. Um, I work very hard with a lot of other people to expose the crisis in the church, you know, 15 years ago. But I'm not going to be quiet about it. And if somebody is still offending, maybe not violating uh, a, a minor anymore, but the cover-up and the lying about it and continue to be in the authority um, in our administration of our church, I'm going to make sure that, they, that people know who they are. And we mentioned... Um, Whirl, as an example. Um, and there's others coming down that will definitely um, be stripped of their orders as well. And it's just a matter of time, just like it was a matter of 15 years just waiting for the faucet to stop dripping before everybody realized the, there is no integrity in a number of our hierarchy, and there's no accountability at all unless we require it of them. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to do that, and that's why you're here, that's why I'm here, so we can discuss it because this is our church. We actually have failed too. I grew up as a passive Catholic. I didn't become a Eucharistic minister or anything. I went to church on Sundays, but I failed by, by not being more involved in the administration of my local parish. And I think that's part of our responsibility is belonging to an organization is to be involved. Make people People do what they're supposed to do and follow the law. And I, I'm not sure to answer your, your question. I think we can do nothing
nothing about it. I'm, in fact, I'm really terribly offended by the Pope not doing something with a Vatican visit uh, to the United States. Uh, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo went uh, to Rome, probably asking, I'm only assuming, asking him to send somebody to the United States with a papal visit. I'm still waiting. Are you still waiting? I mean, I hear nothing from the Pope about this issue in the United States. Everybody's asking the same questions. Lay people are asking the same questions. So the elephant is in the room is, who's in charge? And we really don't hear from the people that are in charge. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you said that you're, you're not a theologian or a canon lawyer. Thankfully, we have a theologian and a canon lawyer. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to hear from Rick and then Jennifer about this same question about what can uh, a lay person, what, what can lay people do? Yeah, it's the $64,000 question, and it gets asked anytime we do this kind of thing, right? Um, I, I, I appreciate everything that Justice Burke just said. I, I do want to argue that we're not quite as powerless, though, as, as we might imagine. You know, there's a distinction in political theory between strategic action and tactical action. Strategic action is what you do when you control the, <clears throat> the field of play. Tactical action is what you do when you don't, right? So we can't act strategically because we don't control a lot of things. We don't have people in office and so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean we can't act in tactical ways. There aren't what, you know, and, and I, I think there's a kind of myth of powerlessness. I mean, there is a kind of power that we can exercise. Now, it's not the power of those who are in control. It's a different kind of power. It may be a power that has to subvert. It has to be a power that uses moral suasion. Uh, it's, it has to be a power that sometimes shames our leaders into action, which is why you know the modest work of people like myself is the more informed the people of God is, the more theologically informed they are about what our own tradition calls us to, the more we can call our bishops to be what our tradition calls them to be, the more we can appeal to the Second Vatican Council that d its teaching that demands them to create circumstances where they can create structures where they have to listen to God's people, right? Uh, we can demand those kinds of things, it seems to me. Uh, we can point out the way in which the operative theology of ordained ministry is not faithful to our best tradition. And so we're arguing from, not from a position outside, we're arguing from a position, from our own tradition, and we're saying we're not faithful to our own best lights. And that for that to happen, you need an informed laity, you know? And so my, you know, the modest contribution of us, we academics, is to say we've got to inform the whole people of God. Help them to know what our tradition calls them to, and then they need to speak out to the, their priests and bishops and demand that they act in fidelity with the teachings of the council, with Pope Francis's leadership, not disputing in any way his, his uh, uh, failure to act in certain ways, but Francis has certainly given us a lot of language that we can use to pressure our bishops and other clergy into action. Thank you, and uh, Jennifer. And then we'll go back to the audience for questions. Yeah, and you know, I guess I I would also agree that we're not powerless. Um, and let me speak again from my perspective, which was someone that was working in the church, and you know, all the lies and the deceit and the attempt to to like hide our inner dysfunction. It's all done for your benefit, because we need you. I, Pope Francis can po appoint whoever he wants as bishop. I'm not disputing that. I leave the, 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 the theology to the theologians. Um, but if you don't show up for mass, and more importantly, if you're not putting money in the coffer, um, that role won't do him a lot of good. OK? So I think there's. You know, I, there, there are problems within the institutional church, but they're not unique to the church, some of them, right? And we can look at things that we're learning through things like the Me Too movement, about how organizational structures contribute to environments that promote sexual misconduct, sexual harassment, sexual abuse. What do those tend to be? Well, cultures of secrecy, okay? Um, one of the things that they regularly point out is whether um, an employer, a corporate employer, um, takes advantage of um, mandatory arbitration to prevent um, sexual misconduct suits from becoming public, because that would be scandal, right? Ask yourself if your diocese has a mandatory arbitration policy, because let me tell you, the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis does, okay? Um, another thing is women in leadership. OK? 
Okay. Uh, the more women that are in leadership, the less um, there's a division and an attitude of, of division that encourages misconduct. Now, there is a theology behind our church, um, but I don't think we have to stand for the fiction of a connection between the power of orders and the power of governance. And I say a fiction, because although they will say that, that is not how they act. And I'll give you just one example. When I first started as a canon lawyer, I worked on tribunals, okay? And the rule in the church is, in order for there to be a single judge on a marriage case, which many, many, many dioceses in the United States do, so just one judge will decide a case for somebody's marriage annulment, okay? That judge has to be a priest, okay? Now, practically speaking, and just about every woman who's a canon lawyer will tell you that, that particular priest who is hearing 400 marriage cases a year might be in the office once, twice, a month. And what's actually happening is there's staff, lay staff, often women, um, who are actually writing the decisions and then using an auto pen and signing this priest's name, and that decision is then binding, okay? That's the fiction of the connection between the power of orders and the power of governance. Now, if they want to say that all of those decisions are invalid because they weren't actually done by the priest who needed to do them, fine, I'll have that conversation. But until they do, we have a fiction between that. And you see that as well as the synod, with the synod, right? Because how many women are voting in the synod? How many lay people are voting in the synod? Non-ordained religious men. So why aren't there women? If you don't have to be clerics, why are there women? So that's another thing we can do. Um, another fiction that I think we, we as the faithful need to insist on is this idea that the clerical state is conferred for life. Now this is different than theology, right? Theology says that the sacred character of orders is conferred for life. But the clerical state is lost regularly. It has been since the 80s, right? We've, we all know laicized priests. We now know that priests have been dismissed from the clerical state. We've heard these words, right? We know um, late vocation priests, sometimes priests who are married and are widowed, sometimes priests who are married and then divorced are then ordained, right? So the clerical state, the idea that the clerical state is conferred for life isn't something that is actually the practice of the church, but yet we act as though it is. So that means when we've ordained somebody who is completely unfit, maybe due to sexual misconduct, but maybe because he's just a really bad priest. How many of you have ever had a parish with like a really bad priest, right? Yeah, exactly. And so what do they do? Well, you know, you're ordained for life. We have to move him to another parish. You know, we'll give him another responsibility so he can go and ruin other people's lives. We need to instead acknowledge that the clerical state is not conferred for life, and ordination should come with a continual discernment on the part of the priest and on the part of the diocese, so that we can say, you're not filling our needs. You don't need to remain in this state with us any longer. Those aren't theological changes. Those are things that we can insist on now. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you, for being here. It's so informative. My name is Christine Lawless. I'm a physician. I'm at Holy Name Cathedral. I'm a parishioner there. Um, and I, I finally woke up about two months ago on this whole subject. I actually felt like you, Dr. Jennifer. Um, I feel all the laity has been complicit because we keep putting our money in the basket mm. every Sunday. We, the, the United States Catholic Church has spent $4 billion on the settlements for these cases. That is our money. Somebody said it earlier, we are the body of Christ in the Catholic Church. We're the ones supporting this whole thing. 
and I'm tired of it. I've kind of had it. I've just decided I have had it. Um, we've done actually a couple of things at Holy Name. One is informal, the other is formal, because I think we should try to work within the structure, even though it may be hopeless, but we, we met with Father Greg, our pastor, and with the chancellor for the archdiocese, who happens to be our deacon, and we formed a, I guess you call it a task force or focus group, as to what we can do, and somebody said it earlier, to educate the laity as to what is going on, how many cases there have been, the money, Chicago alone, archdiocese has put in $220 million of our money to pay off these things. So um, my question for all of you is, we have this task force that's within the church, but I really feel, and I want to know what you think about this, the laity need to sort of rise up and organize and apply pressure from the outside. I really don't see how we're going to change this situation since we don't have any power in the church. The only thing we have is this, and that's the only thing they're going to respond to. So I want to know what you feel about applying that pressure from the outside by the laity organizing. That's a great question. I would ask yeah. Jennifer to respond first. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond because I think um, I agree with everything you said. The only thing um, that I, I want to to kind of make a statement about first is the idea of settlements and church money going to settlements. I, I get very con concerned sometimes that we're setting up a false dichotomy because, again, the people who are receiving these settlements, they're us. They were abused because they are us. They are the Catholic faithful that were hurt. And I think it has to be part of our responsibility as Catholics to see that they are, what, that we do what we need to do to make them whole. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, we've kind of been taught to think in those terms. And I just, I really think that I always want to bring bring us back to the fact that they are us too. Um, and they've been harmed and they've been hurt. Um, but there's a lot of other ways the church is using our money that, that do, isn't Do you think settlement. that some of the money is being used to continue to house the guilty priests? Oh, it, 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 I know it is. Yeah, I don't want to contribute to that anymore. Yeah, and I, and I think I don't I think want that's, to support them in any way. That makes sense. Yeah. Some of that is pension scheme related, but still, I agree with you 100%. I can think of a million ways, um, you know, that the, the church spends money sometimes that we wouldn't we wouldn't all agree with. Um, and I agree with you uh, entirely too about empowering people um, and wanting to work within the system, which is which is kind of why I said that the changes I was mentioning these aren't theological changes; these are just an acknowledgement of of a reality. Do either of you two want to? Yeah. Well, bureaucracies are very difficult um, to move the needle with, to make changes. Um, in most businesses, we all do audits to make sure that we're doing best practices in our businesses and things like that. And that's the first thing we did in our investigation was audit, um, uh, do some audits around the country. And um, we were at the behest of the bishops to give us the information from their files about the abusers. We know now they only gave us what they wanted to give us. And that was files that they did keep, not the files that they didn't take or the files that they had torn apart. But we do know that there are secret files, but they don't like to use the word secret, but they use restricted files or confidential files, and that's what um, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia used a civil authority subpoena for to get, and they got those files. So in the terms of numbers and the, and the abused individuals around the country, you have to times by five or six, because there's we don't even know all the people that have been abused. And they are our Catholics. I agree with Jennifer. They're us. However, the church has been systematically um, fighting giving over information. For instance, in um, Los Angeles, Cardinal Mahoney had 15 lawyers with him every time we interviewed him. 15 lawyers. Uh, we got um, lawyers from everyone. I mean, 
Cardinal Dolan when he was in Milwaukee. We interviewed him. He had 12 lawyers. And I think there was something about cemetery money put in place mm -hmm. to prevent a payout to the victims at that time. Um, and in terms of us get, coming together and doing things, yes, it's the lay people that have to rise up. And I do not think we can ever shame these people. They have no shame. If they're not shamed by now, they never will be. Um, they, they absolutely know what they did, when they did it, and they intentionally did it. I do have one good story, though, about Cardinal Supich, which is absolutely some, several of them, but this one in particular. He first came to Chicago, and I had known him when I was on the National Review Board, and I had known a number of the victims. One of them's name was Rick Springer. And for decades, he tried to get his file from the archdiocese. He paid money to lawyers, he, and the archdiocese never would let him look at it. Well, he was dying at the Veterans Administration Hospital two years ago, and um, or three years ago now, Supich has been here for three years. So I called the um, Archbishop Supich and said, if you could do one good thing for a victim, do it now. Let this man see his file before he died, and Cardinal Supich did do that. But Rick was unable to review it, but he held it while he was dying. This church in the United States has been fighting disclosure and what they've done with lawyers and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars of our money, fighting the situation, when all we had to do was just be what Catholics are, and welcoming people, and trying to hold their hand, and comfort them when they're in stress. Changing the bureaucracy from inside is, I think, impossible at this point in the crisis in the church today. I don't believe, I don't think anyone here, I know I don't anymore, trust a bishop or a cardinal, maybe individually, but can we trust them to appoint another board or other people to review what they're doing? And I don't think so. I can't trust them. Well, I, I just want to follow up on that because, again, um, you know, uh, Justice Burke mentioned the audits, and um, I'm sure everybody here knows that every you know year you get your diocese report about how well they did in the audits and things. Um, but this is this is kind of typical church PR because we report on the audit. And so what I used to observe people doing from within the chancery is, for instance, one of the questions you have to answer is how many clergy do you have who have completed the essential three? So the training, the background checks, um, and sign the code of conduct. And so what some of our employees would do every year is they'd count up the number of um, essential three that we had, and then they'd go through the list of clergy and start eliminating people from the list so the number matched. I mean, this was just a standard practice because it would be bad for the diocese to be flagged in the audit. That was the idea. Although, if any of you have ever read the audit reports, you'll know that every single year there are dioceses who don't even bother to participate. And there have been zero consequences for them on that, which in itself is mind boggling. Um, but so just be aware that everything is about um, convincing you that they've got this under control. That's right, exactly so correct. Does anyone else want to respond to that or a question? Yes, I, you know, I wanted to bring up a couple of points and maybe you can respond to them. Uh, the first one is, my wife and I are discussing, uh, and, I, and I realized, I don't even know how you would do this. I really feel there needs to be a lay oversight committee, and I'm not sure at what level, at diocese, state, you know, I don't really know, but what are your thoughts? And you know, men and women, it has to, has to be like that because, you know, it, it's a big closed society, okay? I worked at the pastoral center when I was, I was on Superior for five years, so I know how, how the organization runs. So, 
you know, your thoughts on that? That's a great question. I, I'll ask uh, Rick to address that first. He literally wrote the book called <laughs> By What Authority? Uh, do you want to, and Not then, on that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what, is there anything in the church that would, that would not allow any kind of a, a lay board to have any kind of superstructure authority? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's not in it. That's really a canonical thing. So okay. let Jennifer respond to that. Well, it's, it's really just what I said before when I was talking about the link between the power of orders and the power of governance. The idea in the church is that in order to exercise governance in the church, you have to be ordained. Lay people can cooperate at times in the exercise of government of governance but they can't exercise governance which means that every time we have lay boards and we have lots of them right we have parish councils diocesan finance councils we have all of these we have lay people on corporate boards um, but there's always reserve powers that are held by the bishop. And so you have no ability to exercise any power. You're in an advisory capacity, um, or sometimes in a, a voting body. But even in those cases, um, you know, so like a, a finance council, a diocesan finance council will have lay people on it, and sometimes the bishop has to get their consent in order to do something. Some of you might, for instance, have had um, property, seen property sold. So the bishop has to get the consent of these lay people. Well, what happens if the lay people don't want to consent? He doesn't have to, because the bishop has the power to remove them at will. So uh, there's no way that lay people in the church right now can exercise real authority outside of um, some of our religious orders and within their structure. But within a, di a diocesan structure, it just doesn't exist. Would you agree? You, no. you, dis you disagree or you disagree? I, I agree on canonical grounds. I, I'm uncomfortable with your, con your imagining that the only real authority is canonically mandated authority. There are other ways in which you can create structures that have genuine authority that's exercised, genuine power that's wielded beyond that which is canonically permitted. So what would you suggest in this circumstance? Well, I think, for example, you could create a, uh, a lay board which is empowered to uh, investigate a particular case and will report their, uh, you know, a bishop that they believe in their mind needs to be removed, will report that to the Holy See. Their report will be public. Now, they don't have the juridical authority to actually see that that bishop is removed, but the pressure is now on the Holy See to simply ignore their report and their recommendation. That's real power. That's not juridical power. That's not governance. But I think it's a mistake to boil everything down in the church to either you have canonical authority or you have none. No, there are lots of ways in which we can exercise genuine power and authority in the church beyond that which is canonically mandated or permitted. I have an example of um, when, during the, the crisis um, 15 years ago, when Bob Bennett, Bill Burley, and I were visiting Rome, we met with um, Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, and Monsignor Scaluna, who was the promoter of justice, and he was like the attorney general of the world. He prosecuted um, all the priests and clerics who um, had been charged with some crime uh, can under canon law. And during that conversation, um, Cardinal Ratzinger absolutely did not know that the uh, city of Tucson, or the, arch di the diocese in Tucson, Arizona, was under civil authorities because the bishop, O'Brien, had um, committed a manslaughter while he was drunk driving. And he absolutely had no idea it was, Ratzinger had, was actually appalled at the fact that someone else was running the diocese, or no one, the, the diocese couldn't buy anything, they couldn't sell anything, nothing. It was under the civil authorities in, the, um, in Tucson, Arizona. And the other thing that we discovered, and so did Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, is Bob Bennett had asked um, Scaluna, how many trials have you conducted on the files of the priests in the United States that were sent to you? And he said, none. Because the files that he got were empty. And the reason he told us that they were empty is because the bishop in the diocese didn't put the information about the charges for that priest because they were afraid they were going to be subpoenaed. Mm -hmm. And that's how much got done that way. So there are ways they can avoid everything. And just like Rick said and the Jennifer said, there's absolutely 
no way for us to actually know what's going on. And I think that's probably my whole point. We have no idea what they're doing, what they're intending to do, or what they will or won't do, based on the fact that now they do know that there's fewer people in the pews. There's people that are actually angry now and rising up, as you suggest. And that's what we have to do more. We have to have more conversations like this all around the country. And I think it'll turn out to be that they'll feel that something's going Going wrong and they better do something. I don't know what they could do under uh, can, whether it's canon law or not, but they better do something because there won't be anybody in the pews. Well, and I just want to go back to the point about um, the non canonical investigation because I think it's a really interesting one. Um, it, I don't know that it's actually worked out that way. And I would kind of defer to Grant, because he was the one who broke the story on this. But we saw this in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, after I left, because we had um, an archbishop, Archbishop Neinstead, who was accused of sexual misconduct. I've lost count on how many um, seminarians, priests, um, lay people and others uh, who accused him of sexual misconduct. And the archdiocese at that time did not choose to employ canonical methods, and I think they were wrong about that. Um, but what they actually did is they had um, non-canonist lay people investigate it. And um, it was a very expensive investigation. Um, it did become public, but nothing happened. So Archbishop Nine said um, he had a, he was working at a parish and um, he was on the board of the Napa Institute and he was on the board of the Catholic University of America and he was attending ordinations at the North American College in Rome and a lot of other things I can't remember all of them um, but there were no consequences whatsoever um, that came from that investigation. So I think it, it can be a little bit complicated. We follow up? No, that's right. But I would. Okay. Yeah. Someone else. Okay, great. I want to go to the center. Thanks. Okay. Hello. I want to thank everybody here, and especially Justice Burke, who has been on this in this diocese for a long time. Um, I came to this diocese because there were counselors available in the 90s because of Bernadine, and um, I just, our family didn't take any money, and it was in Minnesota, New all, and I may be related um, <laughs> to one of those priests. Um, but I just want to thank the people who are listening. And I know it's civil and canon and theological, but it was a family. It was brothers, mm -hmm. myself. And in 2002, we got to, I got to give the statement. And the priest was like, well, I was his roommate, and I didn't think anything happened. I said, well, I was five, and I pulled a knife on him and said, if you want to kill me, I will kill you. Mm -hmm. And that stayed with me. And it's the first time I told anybody. He is on the list. He has been compensated in New Ulm. But my family never once didn't believe me, never once didn't say I couldn't be the woman or grow. Now there has been obstacles in that. But I want to thank IPS and Loyola for providing the counseling. It was very private back then. Mm. It's been hard to have this come up over and over again, and I'm in my 50s. I do have confidence in the young people. You're going to figure out. I mean, the tree in the fall, the top of the leaves fall first, <laughs> but the roots stay good, mm -hmm. and the roots stay healthy. And um, I just want to thank the people who are choosing to study the church. And uh, we're having a mass at Holy Family Church October 20th. And the survivors are priests, deacons, doctors, um, counselors, grandmas. <laughs> and um, pray for us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right up here, I think. Oh, uh, did you? I, I thought I saw your hand yeah. raised. Sorry. Hi. Um, what is the civil authority doing while all this is going on? 
what is the state's attorney or the attorney general, uh, uh, are these not violations of civil law? Yeah, the archdiocese that I worked in, the archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis was charged criminally. I think they were, at that time, they were only the second no, they might have been the first diocese actually to be to, to be criminally charged. Um, we had a very good um, uh, county attorney who um, charged them for 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 a number of things. But one of them, interestingly enough, was for creating a situation in which um, these children were endangered and then required the state to be providing care. So they really stretched the law as far as they were able to, considering how um, vociferously the church will usually assert First Amendment protections. So as a result of that, the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, is under um, an agreement where um, they're actually being monitored and audited by the civil authorities authorities, um, and they've had to put changes in, in their structure. But no one has gone to jail or gone to a criminal trial or been... Well, we've had plenty of priests who have gone to jail, but not... A, um, Father Waymeyer, of course, went to jail for um, a number of years, um, and we've had other priests who have gone to jail, but none of the archdiocesan authorities have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A, a few thoughts on apologize for late. We're coming from Milwaukee and Marquette. So the traffic is not what we're used to. <laughs> and you might have already addressed this before, but just you know, thinking in terms of structurally for the church, I wonder if this is maybe a moment in time where we have to collectively rethink and discern kind of the role of, of bishop. You know, if you look into the church's past, it was one bishop was elected by the people and stayed with that particular local church. Mm -hmm. Also, there is a real sense of um, uh, fraternal correction. Right now, that's not really inside the code. Or even the CDF doesn't have powers to charge bishops as they do to defrock priests. So I wonder if, if you're kind of thinking about in terms of what we can do canonically and juridically, either through CDF or in terms of the congregation of bishops, how we select bishops, how we can provide personal uh, correction, as well as also if there could be a, a lay presence in those congregations that really would be bringing that voice forward in the discernment of our uh, hierarchy. I don't know if they're currently thinking about that over in the Vatican, but just just some thoughts. I'm not sure if you have any responses or if this makes yeah, who, sense. Who would like to take this one? Uh, Rick, maybe, and then Jennifer. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know about you all, but how many of you have actually gone through pastoral planning processes in your diocese? Anybody here? No, you've heard about them, though. You've read, yeah, okay. Does anybody but me think that maybe we should have like a national pastoral planning process where we look at dioceses? I mean, wouldn't it kind of be interesting to see if all of the, the criteria that they've been applying to our, our churches when they're closing them, you know, are you evangelizing? How often, you know, how big is your choir? All those things. What if that was applied for dioceses? Because where I live in Minnesota, we have five dioceses now. But at one time, the diocese was all of Minnesota and the Dakotas. And that was a time when it took a long time to travel. I mean, have we ever stopped and considered how that structure reflects the reality of our church? Um, I think we should really push for that now. Um, part, of, part of it, because I'm a really practical person, and I know that a lot of dioceses were created to solve problems with priests and bishops. So there's a diocese in Minnesota that was created because um, the bishop didn't like the Monsignor who was running the cathedral and he couldn't demote him, so they made him a bishop, created a new diocese for him. Um, if they could do that before, maybe a way to get rid of bad bishops would be to merge some dioceses. I don't think we need as many as we have, right? Um, so I, I think that kind of pastoral planning on a national level, now again, they won't be able to, they could advance a plan that would then be implemented by Rome, but I think having those conversations would be really important. I'm a little skeptical when I hear about the appointments of lay people to these various councils and things, because um, again, in my experience, because you can't wield any real power, it tends to be tokenism. I mean, that's, that's just my experience of how it works, but. Uh, Rick or Justin? Sorry. Over here, then we'll go over there. I have, I have two in mind. Thank you. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Carly Ann, and I work at Old St. Pat's. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and um, we had a listening session a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I do want to say that that listening session happened because I showed up at work one day and I was furious. And I said, everybody, we're having a meeting. And then two weeks later, 400 people were at our church talking. So um, we do have power. Um, and um, don't wait for your priest or your bishop to tell you you can do something, because then you'll never do get to do it. Um, but I do have a question. One of the things that's been weighing on me as an individual a lot is um, at the end of our listening session, the last woman to go to speak was a mother. And she said that her children are the reason she goes to Mass because they want to go. And her daughter asks her, are we going to Mass this like today, this weekend? Are we going? And, and she doesn't want to go. And she doesn't know how to talk to her kids about um, the problems in the church. But one of, one of the things that she said her daughter asks her is, Mommy, when can I be a priest? Mm. And me, like, riled up in the back of the church, like, totally inappropriately, was like, soon! <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm wondering, uh, in all reality, like, how close are we to that? Or, like, <laughs> are you saying reality? <laughs> like, in, uh, yeah, I mean, in my dreams, we're really close, right? But, like, in, you know, like, like I've heard that, oh, I think what you were saying, maybe women could be appointed to be cardinals. Uh, you don't have to be ordained to be a cardinal. Can we just talk about used to. what? Didn't used to. Okay, so like, I don't really know anything on that topic. Anybody have any like thoughts about um, what we can and, and can't do, and what would have to change? Who wants to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I guess that means you, Rick. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of things. I mean, for example, there, we have to make a distinction between what's possible canonically. I'm sorry to keep making this distinction. What's pro possible doctrinally? So right now, canonically, women can't be cardinals. But that's, a, that's strictly a disciplinary thing. That could, there's nothing about church doctrine or anything like that that would prohibit a change in church law that would allow women to become cardinals in the church. And of course, there are reluctantly some more things like chancellors of diocese where, and marriage tribunal judges and so on and so forth, where women are in included. But let's face it, I think Jennifer's right. In many ways, it still feels like tokenism in a lot of ways. And at the, the places where some of the most important decisions are being made in the church, I mean, for example, to me, it's ridiculous that we do not have virtually, well, the larger problem, why don't we have lay people in much more prominent roles in the Roman Curia, for example? There's very little argument for why we have to have primarily an almost exclusively clerics in the Roman Curia. So at so many levels, at the level of church doctrine, there's no reason why we can't do that. But there would need to be changes in church law. Now, the question about the ordination of women to the priesthood is realistically, you know, I think the theological arguments in support of your position are very strong. I think I don't ever want to underestimate the role of the Holy Spirit, but I suspect that's She's going to be charge, a long right? time in coming. Uh, all I can say is that we have to continue to say, these are the arguments. Give me the counter arguments. They don't seem compelling arguments. And, you know, that takes a great deal of patience. Uh, I, I don't hold out a lot of hope that that's going to happen any time in the near future. Uh, all we can do from my point of view, uh, from the point of view of theologians, is to continue to make the arguments, to make the arguments, to get as many places where those arguments are being heard, and hopefully gradually we chip away. I actually think indirectly, one of the more important things that gives me hope about Pope Francis isn't about this. You know, Pope Francis is doctrinally conservative. So if you're theologically left-leaning, as you know, a lot of people in this room probably are, that can be frustrating. Right. But there's a way in which that's less important than what he's interested in doing. So Francis's gift to the church is his emphasis on synodality, his emphasis on a listening church. And I think that's more important than people want to realize. And that's where I, I, I hold a little bit of uh, hope. Because if you are take seriously Francis's call that we need to be a listening church, that we need to create more structures where church leadership listen to people like you and people like me, 
And if you can join that with Francis's commitment to call forth pastoral leaders who have the smell of the sheep on them, right? Who are genuinely interested in service. If you put those two conditions together, you create a situation where pastoral leaders who are sensitive to the concerns of the people of God have to start listening to the frustrations of people like you. And that can gradually bring about change. So even though I don't think he's interested in doctrinal change, I think he's actually creating creating the conditions in the church that can allow that change to happen, all right? I think that um, I totally agree with you, Doctor, because listening is, is the key, and that's where it's not occurred. Um, even sure. in the, the cardinals and the bishops in this situation have not listened to the parents and the lay Catholics and in the in the church at all. In fact, there's a um, a sign on the back wall of our Supreme Court here in Illinois: "Audi alterum partum." Hear the other side, and that's a mandate to the justices who uh, to the people who appear in front of in front of us each time we go out. But it's also a good mandate to all of us to listen to each other listen to us to each other in our home and our families and I do totally agree that that's what Francis is trying to do but it hasn't filtered down in the bureaucracy and they're not used to this they haven't right. listened to anybody and training people to listen to each other has to rise from us to be heard no one's going to listen to us unless we're heard in unison and that's where I think these conversations really are important and we need more of them all over. So the words that you are saying and wanting to be heard have to be listened to and make them listen. That's that's an important I, so I just have to put a quick word in for Canon Lars because I would point out that they've been arguing for a long time now that there's no there's no reason why women can't be ordained deacons even now. So that and that's not a doctrinal issue. Um, so this has been something that's floated in the church for a long well, time. There's too. an argument about whether I, I agree it's not a doctrinal issue. We've got to convince the Vatican it's not a doctrinal issue. <laughs> Do you have any um, resources you would recommend for a laity to educate themselves on this topic? A degree in IPS. <laughs> <laughs> Is it free? <laughs> but but um, one thing that's always been frustrating to me, and you know, again, there's there's theology and there's canon law, but if you want to exercise your rights in the church, it helps to know them. So when you go, can you take classes in canon law to educate the lady? I mean, is that part of our curriculum? Why is that not part of our catechism, right? We all take civics in high school. Why should we not also be learning about our church structures um, in confirmation classes and religious classes and ongoing formation? Because I can tell you why. There's never been an attempt to uh, to share that information. In fact, it's only recently that you've even been able to read the Code of Canon Law in English. And that wasn't because they wanted all of you to read it. <laughs> right? Over here. I have uh, two questions. <coughs> Accountability to Christ or accountability to the church seems to be our problem. Yeah. A friend of mine in my um, Bible study w went to the ordination at Holy Name Cathedral recently, and she, she mentioned to me, if I heard correctly, they profess to the church. They are committing to the church, not to Christ. Mm -hmm. That's our problem. Yeah. If, it, if, if, if every one of us, including the bishops, including the pope, was committed to Christ, we wouldn't be here in this room right now. And it's a conscious problem. Uh, our, just do we have one as a church? That's what I want to know. I, I taught at St. Alphonsus in 1980. Oh, I was there one month. In the one month that I was there, there was a little girl who kept, in January, had mosquito bites all over her body, seemed to be. And I asked her, I said, Martha, you know, what is mosquito bite? She said, I said, it's January. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that her stepfather was burning her with cigarette butts. Mm -hmm. She was deaf in one ear, and he didn't like her. In my one month, mm -hmm. we, as civil, you know, when we talk about civil, 
where were these people? Where are these people that cannot make a phone call to a police department, to somebody, somebody? And I'm not, you know, applauding myself. I signed a paper at St. Alphonsus saying that if I saw an abused child of any kind of abuse, I would report it. That was the third week of my time teaching. So where is our conscience? As a, as a church, that's what I'm asking. Are we too big? And by the way, uh, um, Justice, I'm a public Catholic. Mm. I'm not, I did not go to Catholic schools. Mm. You're in public, <laughs> I get that. I did graduate from Catholic Theological Union, though, as a pastoral <laughs> study station. Uh, anyone want to respond to that, or we can? Take another, I, or go I ahead. Because yep. um, I, I think one of the, you know, yeah. again, we're talking about structures, um, and we have to talk about the abuse that occurs within the structures towards the people that work within it. And I think your question is, are we loyal to Christ or the bishop is a really important one. But for those, again, for those of us, again, who work very strongly within diocesan structures, I'll tell you that one thing that was regularly told me was that I can't love Christ more than I love the bishop. But, but this is but the, exactly so, I, and I'm not offering it as a defense. Um, but I think I think that's a reality of the situation that needs to happen. Now I will also tell you um, that one of the things that influenced my process, interestingly enough, um, is never in my life was I ever ministered to by diocesan clergy. So I was baptized at a parish by Oblates. I was raised at a parish with Croziers. I was educated by the Sisters of St. Joseph and then the Jesuits. Um, so I had a different theological backbone that was informing my decisions. Um, but for people who are within the church and think especially of our clergy who um, have their whole lives really um, in the control of a bishop, um, that, that attitude, that understanding um, that you can't love Christ more than the bishop can be an incredibly ab abusive aspect. Why are we Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a serious problem. If we are not accountable to Christ, mm. that is a big problem. And I don't think the Pope can change that. Well, I, we are all accountable to Christ, right? Um, I'm kind of hoping I can think of the bishops I want ahead of me in line when I meet St. Peter, right? I can think of a few of them that if they're ahead of me, I'll think I'll skate right in. Um, but we are ultimately all accountable to Christ. Okay. Hi, my name is Shane, and I'm a graduate here from IPS in pastoral counseling. And uh, I guess first I wanted to say thanks. It's like hearing from you all is a ministry to us, just because we've been trying to have conversations in our parish with parish leaders, and it's really hard. <laughs> and so just the experience of being heard by you all and responded to is just a tremendous ministry. So first of all, thank you for that. My question was, I was going to ask the same question that's basically been asked <laughs> two other times about like, okay, laity, what do we do? So I'm not going to ask it that way. I want to kind of try to make it a little more concrete. So um, there is this sense of, uh, in my parish, there's kind of people break into three camps. There's the people who say, who are activated by this three camps. People who say, I'm out of here. I've had enough. I'm done. On the other extreme, there's the people who say, um, yeah, I see, I'm activated by this, but the structure's never gonna change, it's just the way it is, and so we're just gonna go on business as usual. So then there's a middle camp, and I, I myself, is in, I'm in that middle camp of to say, I'm not bolting and running, and yet I am absolutely not content to just say it's business as usual. And yet, you know, we're, I, we're still not coming up with anything of like practically, what do we do? And so I guess the way I want to ask the question is, you know, you say, use your voice, be heard, be heard. So uh, let's say we could sit down with our pastoral staff. And, and what would be one or two really concrete things that could kind of move the needle a little bit, that if I could sit down with a couple of priests at my parish and I go to them to express, like, 
right now, if they were to say, Shane, what do you want me to do? What, what, what action? Like, can you all give us one or two concrete steps of, of what would we go if we could have our voice heard by a pastoral staff person, uh, a priest? What, what would be a couple of things that, that you would encourage us to ask them to try to kind of move it just a little, let's make a little progress? Okay. Good question. Thank you. Who, who wants to take that first? Well, you know, there are. I've become a congregationalist in a way. I find the parish that I can worship with others who worship, want to worship with me too, and and do direct service to humanity in the community. You know, if things are so so overwhelming and not able to do things, and I and I think I try to speak out as often as I can, but for my own. Um, worship. I want to worship with people who will worship with me. And it might not be that parish that you're in, where people are together. Old, she, the young woman here mentioned Old St. Pat's. Well, Father Hurley, he's asking for people to come and talk about this. He had a 400 person listening session. So there's other person, you know, so people can together have a community of like minds um, trying to help each other in their faith to God. And it turns out that that's really what's important anyway, isn't it? Is to raising our children Catholic, good, moral, ethical people. And it's not about faith. It's about poor administration. Um, and there's not a whole lot we can do about that except speaking up as much as we can. But I want I don't want us to leave our faith. And that's what happens. People say, I'm giving up. And if we can get each other to a community of worshiping together and helping each other through this, through our faith, and having our children and our grandchildren participate in what we knew growing up was moral, ethical living and helping our, our neighbors as much as possible. I think that faith worship is probably more important than trying to change the structural <laughs> you know, the strictures of the um, the Vatican. But definitely we have to speak up for that too. But let's not give up our faith. And that's what I'm worried about. That's why I want to talk about it all the time, is that there's a difference here. It's not about the structure of the church and bad priests and cardinals and bishops not listening. They never really did listen to us, but we just see it now more, more clearly. And I, I think that we we really have to listen to each other. And that's what Rich said, too. We have to be listening to each other and helping each other and worshiping together in a community. Of that, that's what we were brought up with. And keep our communities together, whether we have hierarchy or not. You know, I think... I think about this a lot, not just in terms of my students. I think about this in terms of my four adult sons who are each in their own way grappling with to what extent they can continue to go to mass. So I, I grapple with this as a parent as much as I do as a, you know, a theologian. What do we do concretely in the parish? The theologian in me wants to say, if nothing else, we've got to remind one another that, that the church is more than the dysfunctional institutions that are getting so much attention. That, that what makes me love the church still is there. The things that I love about being Catholic are still there. The liturgical and sacramental life of the church is still there. The, the word of God can still be proclaimed. The liturgy can be celebrated in ways that are moving. The people can be called forth in context where they can support one another, where we can be sent out to serve the needy. All of those things can still happen in the midst of this institutional dysfunction. That's not an argument for complacency. Let me be very clear. It seems to me we also have an obligation to speak out against the dysfunction in the church wherever we can. We need to call our leaders to accountability wherever we can. But, but I don't want the dysfunction to define what my Catholic belonging is all about. Does that, does that make sense? And so I want a pastoral team that says, we're going to keep arguing for you. We're going to be in the bishops here. We're going to do all of that. But in the meantime, we're going to call forth the best of what our Catholic faith can be. We're going to incarnate that in this community in the best way that we can in the midst of this dysfunction. 
you know. And we're getting to the end here, and, and I, I, I had written, as I was thinking about my thoughts, there was a passage that came to my mind from um, Dorothy Day's autobiography, The Long Loneliness. And I'd, I'd like to end with it because it, it calls for a kind of ecclesial realism, a realism about both why we love the church, but also a sense of it's inevitable that it will disappoint us. Right? And she wrote, I love the church of Christ made visible, not for itself, because it was so often a scandal to me. The church is the cross on which Christ is crucified. And to be Catholic, one must live in a state of permanent dissatisfaction with the church. <laughs> right? That's tough. Mission accomplished. I love tough. Yeah. She's a realist. Yeah. She was, you know, and she loved her Catholicism and she clung to it with all of her might. But she was a realist about the way in which at the institutional level it lets her down. You know? Yeah, I, I think that the other thing that I would just add is I think that, that um, getting back to the other comment about who our allegiance is to, um, we all have to ask ourselves questions about who we are, what we believe in, what we stand for, and how the things that we're doing are propping up the things that we don't like in the institution. So for me, there was just some very clear things that I decided based on my experience, things that I am not going to be a part of anymore. I am not going to work for an organization that imposes moral clauses on its employees, which the Catholic Church does. And what it says, lay employees sign these contracts that say that they will not do anything that goes against the law or the faith of the Catholic Church or cause it scandal. And I read that and I think, what could any of us do that would cause as much scandal as the leaders who are imposing those clauses do? And those clauses are disproportionately imposed against women and the LGBT community. And I believe in the fundamental dignity of all people. And so I will not give or be a part of an organization that imposes those clauses on its employees, period. That's something that we can do. Um, and there's a million other ways. I won't serve as a canon lawyer any longer in an organization that uses a fiction about the origins of power um, to ignore the contributions of women, especially in lay people, to not acknowledge those, those contributions that they make, and most importantly, that pays them poorly accordingly. I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um, so I think we can ask ourselves who we are, what we value, and then make judgments based on that. I have just one more point to, with Jennifer saying she won't be part of it. I recently received a letter. I'm a Dame of Malta and have been for almost 15 years. My husband's a Knight of Malta, which is a worldwide organization that does wonderful work. But when I received this letter telling me I was not allowed to speak about this issue, and it wasn't just to me, it was to everybody in the organization worldwide. Worldwide. I had to write my resignation. Nation. And I had actually had hope at one point about a month ago that I was going to reach out to the Grand Marshal of the Knights of Malta and ask them, because it's a worldwide organization, to stand up together as lay people belonging to this wonderful Catholic organization to tell the Pope to do something. But now we're told we can't do anything, so I just wrote my letter of resignation, like you, Jennifer. <laughs> So we've come to the end of our time together, but would you join me in giving a round of applause for our panel of experts? I think they all uh, really hit it out of the park. I asked them to stick to 10 minutes so that we could engage the audience who would be here with us this evening. And uh, I appreciate, uh, I think it was Shane who said uh, that it felt like, to me, a ministry that the three of them were able to, uh, to impart to us. Uh, I also feel like as a Jesuit Catholic university, we were able to model the kind of civil and faith-filled conversation that we want to generate around this uh, and 
other topics. We'll continue this discussion uh, with some refreshments. We invite you to continue and, and join us. Uh, stay for as long as you'd like, and uh, we look forward to continuing that. Thank you.